In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today we celebrate the feast day of St. Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei. And today for our meditation, we can reflect on one of his most important and central teachings, which is the sanctification of work. The idea, the reality, we should say, that work for us could be a means to love God, a path to holiness, a way to love God each and every day by doing the work that God has given us to do. In describing Opus Dei and its spirit, St. Josemaria said, we should be like the first Christians, that that's the model of the spirit of Opus Dei, to live in the way that the very first Christians did. And that's an interesting thing to think about in our Lord's presence. What were the first Christians like? What did they have on their mind? What concerns did they have? And the, the first Christians were struck by the reality of the faith, by just how real the incarnation was, especially those first generations of Christians. Because they knew the apostles, they knew people who had seen Jesus, who had heard him him, him preach, who had seen miracles, or they knew people who had been cured by Jesus, or people who had relatives who were cured by him. Perhaps they had even witnessed the resurrection. St. Paul says that Jesus appeared to 500 disciples at one time. And so they knew something very important, that, that God had come very close to them, that God had entered history, and that made a huge impact on them. And so they had a sense, and they were right, that everything had changed, that nothing could remain the same as it was before. Because God, the infinite, almighty, all-powerful creator of the universe, had visited us and had shown his love for us and then had gone away and had promised that he would return. And for a number of reasons, many of the, of the first Christians thought that Jesus was coming back soon, that the end of the world was not a thing in the distant future, but that it was somewhat imminent. And so a question arose in their hearts and in their minds as to, as to how they were supposed to live. Given that God has entered history, drawn so close to us, made us his own, in this radical story of the Incarnation the Redemption, what are we supposed to do now? Questions arose as to, well, maybe we should stop marrying and just leave the world and just wait for our Lord and to remain kind of pure in the faith and separate in order to respond to this closeness of God. And St. Paul, in, in writing to the Corinthians, gives an answer to this question. He says, Let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned, to which God called you. This is my rule in all the churches. And a little later, he repeats the same point. Let each of you remain in the condition in which you were called. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. And so Paul's answer to the question, well, what should we do now? How should we live now? Is basically, as you were. The life that God has given you is the life which he wants you to live. And so he didn't want people en masse leaving the world to, fo to form you know, special religious communities outside of the world. He wanted them to remain as they were and where they were, doing the very things that they were doing before. This, however, <laughs> at the same time, with the realization that indeed everything has changed. St. Paul puts it himself, it is no longer I who live, but Christ 
who lives in me. That they had to live that ordinary life in the condition and the job and the social circumstances in which they were before, which God had given to them. But now, as Christians, with a great faith and a great hope, bearing witness to God's presence and God's love for the world, transforming the world from within it, in the words of our Lord, being salt and light, salt of the earth, light of the world. And this is the basic message that God inspired in San Jose Maria, to help revive in the church the sense that everyone's called to be a saint. And most people are called to be a saint without what we can, we can call a so-called special vocation, to leave the world in some way to dedicate themselves exclusively to prayer. No, most people are called to be saints in a job, in a community, in a normal family life. And most of that normal life, most of that ordinary life, is taken up precisely by work. Work is, is the majority of our waking hours. Some serious task that we dedicate ourselves to. Centuries before Christ, the great philosopher Aristotle said that, that happiness is a life of virtuous activity. That the key ingredient of happiness is virtuous, virtuous activity. Activity that develops the virtues of justice, of wisdom, of fortitude, moderation, self-control, friendship. And if we think about, if we think about our work, well, what kind of virtuous activity would we have if we didn't have some, some serious work to do? Some profession to which we dedicated ourselves to, some skill or some task which formed the 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 meat or the axis of our of our day. How could we develop the virtue of justice, giving to others their due, with an idle life, without working hard? How could we be good friends <laughs> to others? If we, if we were lazy, right? If we weren't hardworking in order to have means to, to help our friends and something to give to them. And if it's true, and I think, I think it is, that happiness is primarily a result of virtuous activity or is constituted by virtuous activity, well, then it's also true that a lack of good activity will lead to sadness. It will lead to frustration and disappointment. There's a psychiatrist I know who likes to define depression as an irrational fear of being exhausted, right? a fear of being overworked. And I'm not saying that that's the only cause of depression. I mean, these things are complicated, obviously. But it's an interesting insight that when we fear being tired from working too hard, we tend to avoid activity. We tend to withdraw from our duties and from others. We tend to think too much about how we're feeling. And in the end, what happens is we end up being precisely depressed, right? Less interested, less active, less outward oriented, right? more introspective. And so the fear of being exhausted leads to a lack of activity, which leads to a real, a real problem, a real it could be a real depression. There's a um, kind of a corny saying, but but I think there's something to it, which is if you're blue, do. Right? If you're sad, get active. Find someone to help. Find something to do. Find something to engage your mind, engage your intention. That's outside of yourself. There's another corny phrase which people use in the context of physical therapy, sports medicine which is motion is the only lotion, right? That if you're injured, you have to exercise precisely that part of your body that's ailing so that it can regain strength. And this was somewhat of a revolution in, in medicine. You know, 50 years ago, if you had, let's say, a hip replacement or something like this, well, you'd be in bed resting and, and trying not to move that part of your body 
for days, perhaps weeks. And now, right after a surgery, you know, as soon as the anesthesia wears off, in many of these serious operations, they have people up on their feet, moving, walking around, trying to rebuild those muscles, strengthen those tendons. And it's very painful, right? I'd rather stay in bed. <laughs> and they're like, no, you have to walk, you have to walk. Ah. So the idea there, though, is that, you know, we don't, we're not going to feel good by sitting around constantly taking our emotional temperature. How am I feeling now? How am I feeling now? How am I feeling now? What's wrong with me? We're going to feel good as a result of being good. And we're going to be good as a result of acting well, doing good things. Lord, in the Bible, Lord Jesus, it's very clear to us that work is a blessing. And it's actually part of man's original vocation, as St. Josemaria would put it. The original vocation given to Adam and Eve the blessing of God upon Adam and Eve includes work. We read in the book of Genesis, So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God blesses them, and he blesses them with a vocation to work. Fill the earth and subdue it. And then in, in the second chapter of Genesis, when we have that second creation account, work also plays a part. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And so in both accounts, we have this reference to activity, to serious activity, subduing the earth, tailing and keeping the garden that is creation. Therefore, we need to have a very positive view of work. Work is constitutive of my happiness. It's a blessing from God. It's, it's an essential arena in which I develop my virtues and those virtues are essential to, to my happiness, both earthly and, and eternal. In the Gospel of John, our Lord is criticized for doing good works on the Sabbath. And his response for us is very helpful. It helps us to see how work can, can truly be something that sanctifies, that makes us like God. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. My father is still working, and I also am working. So there's the sense in our, in our Lord's description of God and of himself that God is active. God works. Right? God does things. And in our human nature, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We're called to participate in his providence and his care over creation, his providence and his care over each other, primarily. And in our Christian vocation, we're called to imitate our Lord, our Lord who worked. Jesus had two jobs. He started as a carpenter, as we know, for many years, that hidden life. And then he transitioned to being a preacher and a healer, a religious figure, a rabbi. Forming those disciples was work, and, and preaching to all those people was work. And we see in the gospel, our Lord has this urgency to move from town to town to help more people, to preach to more people. And there are scenes where it says they don't have time to eat. There were so many people to help. So many people were coming to them that they didn't even have time to have lunch. They were so busy working, preaching, and healing. And so it's a good question, Lord, do I see work as only a necessary evil? Do I do things just to get them over with so that I can rest and entertain myself and do the things I really like to do? Lord, am I lazy? Am I afraid of the effort of work? Am I afraid of the tiredness that, that work naturally brings with it? 
do I work enough? When I'm working, Lord, am I really working? This is one of the big dangers of, of our present state of technology and our current society, is that we can be working, but kind of not really fully working. Because I'm working on something, but I'm also checking Twitter, or I'm um, checking my text messages every every 30 seconds. I'm checking my email, or I'm going taking lots of breaks to see how things are going in the world, or my favorite pastime, or my favorite website, or whatever. And one of the key aspects of St. Josemaria's uh, teaching was that if we're going to offer something to God, if we're going to offer our work to God, which makes it holy, in the way, he says, add a supernatural motive to your work and you will have sanctified it. You're sanctifying our work, sanctifying ourselves in our work, sanctifying others through our work. Really isn't that hard. <laughs> add a supernatural motive, right? Do it for the love of God. Do it for someone who needs grace. Try to do it well. And you will have sanctified it. But but we need to do it well. If we're going to offer something to God, we should try to offer him the best that we have, the best we have to give. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, also in the book of Deuteronomy, where the old law is spelled out, there are passages and passages, pages and pages, dedicated to rules and regulations about how to sacrifice to God, how to offer God a sacrifice. And there are all sorts of, of, of laws governing what can be offered to God. And so the bull has to be of a certain age, and it, and it has to be of a certain gender, and it can't have blemishes on these parts, and it can't have this other defect. And the whole idea is that what's offered to God has to be a real sacrifice. It has to be something good. We can't offer to God something mediocre or poor quality. And the same goes for for our work. St. Josemaria would say that our desk is an altar, and our workplace is an altar. If you work from home, your, your, your home is an altar. If you're dedicated to housework, well, your house, your children are an altar. Your office, your classroom, your laboratory, your factory, your car, if you're an Uber driver or taxi driver or whatever, is an altar. And that's where we offer the sacrifice of our work and, and therefore also of ourselves because we're in our work and, and that's what we're giving our attention to. And that's what we're using our soul for. That's where we offer that work and that effort and ourselves to God. Your desk is an altar. St. John Paul II would say something similar. He would say that man is the priest of his own existence, that we've received ourselves from God. And the task of being human, especially the task of being Christian, is to take it and offer it back to God as a priest, offers sacrifices to God, gives gifts and adoration and love of God to unite the world with God, to reunite the world with God. Well, that's a good question for my work, Lord. Lord, is my work a worthy sacrifice? Is it a sacrifice that's pleasing to you because I'm into the details and I'm doing it with love and I'm pouring myself into it and I'm running the risk of getting tired and I let myself get tired because I should be tired by the end of the day. St. Josemaria was sometime sometimes criticized for the richness of the sacred vessels and the vestments and the decorations that he would use in chapels of Opus Dei. He would have people donate diamonds and other precious stones and have them embedded or encrusted into monstrances for our Lord or into chalices. And he wouldn't skimp at all, even though Many times he didn't have much money at his disposal. He wouldn't skimp at all in anything that was part of divine worship that had to do with the Mass, offering things to God. And he was criticized for that with the typical criticism that, you know, this money could be used better to, to help the poor, 
to alleviate human suffering? You know, why are you, why are you using so much so many resources for divine worship for the liturgy? And that's a false argument. Right? If we really love God well, and the liturgy is essential for loving God well, well, we're going to inspire people to do what God wants. And part of what God wants is to love the poor and to work to alleviate suffering, to care for others. So it's a very um, simplistic <laughs> criticism, right? That the, that the money you put into X is money you take directly away from Y. And money doesn't work that way and neither does life. Putting love and care, and devotion, into the things of God will convert people and inspire them to take care of the poor and, and serve their neighbor and, and spend money there too. But that wasn't St. Josemaria's response to this, to this criticism. He basically said this. He said, look, the day lovers give each other bags of cement or cinder blocks to express their love for each other, well, that's the day I won't try to give God the best that I have in the liturgy, in the chapels. Right? When people get married or get engaged, they they have golden rings with diamonds. and with, you know, They don't use trinkets, cheap things, to show each other how much, how much they love each other. And Lord, we too, we want to show you and offer you our work, showing you thereby a sign of how much we love you. So help me to see, Lord, how can I give you a better offering? Where, Lord, do I skimp on effort and work? Where do I have a negative attitude towards my work, not seeing it as an opportunity to love, to love you, to love and serve others? There's another negative attitude towards work. It's not it doesn't seem negative, but it's 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 a false one, which can creep in in a lot of people's lives and dominate a lot of people's lives, which is kind of the opposite attitude. Right on the one hand, we have thinking that work is a necessary evil, and therefore only doing things to get to get them over with, doing as little work as possible so we can rest more and and have more fun and recreation. On the other extreme. However, there's a, a real danger, and I think it's a danger in uh, in many of our of our contemporary societies, which is making an idol of work, what's called careerism or workaholism. And there we exaggerate the value of our work because because we unite it too closely to our own self worth, and so we think, well, I'm kind of worth what I earn, or I'm. Um, I'm valued by my reputation or my position in my profession, my company. How I'm doing professionally is how I measure how I'm doing personally, or existentially. And that, of course, is a mistake. It's kind of a variation on what's called Pelagianism, right? In Pelagianism, we think, well, the really important thing in life is my will, is my effort, my activity. And God's grace only comes afterwards to kind of help me or second what I do. And so the, the careerist, the workaholic, is relying primarily on his own activity for happiness and for meaning. And only secondarily, perhaps, if at all, on God. The careerist attitude can also be kind of an escape from relationships that one doesn't know how to pray or one doesn't know how to rest properly or one doesn't know how to spend time socially or with one's family, with one's loved ones. And so work becomes an alternative way of finding meaning or fulfillment outside of those key relationships and those other activities of healthy rest and healthy hobbies, and of course, a healthy prayer life. What is sanctification, though? What is holiness? Holiness, the church teaches us, is the fullness of charity. To love God above all things for his own sake 
and to love our neighbor for the sake of God. There's only one ingredient in holiness, and it's charity. Loving God, with everything we have, with our deeds and with our rest, and loving others for the sake of God. And clearly, Lord, our work gives content to our love. St. Josemaria, as a young priest, was a chaplain for some cloistered nuns in Madrid. And as he was giving them communion, he used to tell our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, Lord, I love you more than this one. And I love you more than this one. And I love you more than this one. And then he heard the locution, these words imprinted on his on his soul, a message from God. He heard the words, love is deeds and not sweet words. Love is deeds and not sweet words. How can we love you, Lord, if we're lazy, if we're idle, if we're irresponsible, if we don't shoulder the work that you have given us, if we don't accept the life which you've allotted to us, to which you've called us, those relationships at work and at home, all of which entail some work and some activity to keep up, duties to fulfill, debts to pay, services to perform. Love is deeds and not sweet words. The vocation to work, work as a path to holiness, as a way to love God, has to be at the same time a vocation to prayer, to a truly contemplative life. Charity is to love God for his own sake. And we can't love God for his own sake with our work or through our work unless we love him for his own sake in our prayer, unless we have times where he's the only object of our intention where we're all his and he's all ours. During the Second Vatican Council, St. Josemaria would be visited by different church fathers. And one time, a, a French bishop came to see him. And he was very excited about the message of Opus Dei and also the message of, of the Second Vatican Council itself on the, on the role of the laity and the sanctification of, of the world. And he kept mentioning that idea to St. Josemaria in, in an enthusiastic way the laity are there to transform the world with their work and with their presence. And at one point, St. Jose Maria got up and kind of, you know, grabbed the guy by his shoulders and said, yes, but they will only sanctify the world if they're contemplative. If not, the world will influence them. They won't transform the world. They'll be transformed by the world. We'll only sanctify our work We'll only turn our work into prayer if we're souls of prayer. Lord, help us to keep finding time for adoration, time for our mental prayer, time for our spiritual reading, living that spiritual life which gives us a chance to live in the presence of God and to do other things, Lord, with the sense that you're with us, that we're doing them for you, that we're pleasing you in them, that we're truly your sons and daughters carrying out carrying out the work of God, loving and accepting the life and the status that you've given to us. It's an incredible idea from Corinthians with which we open this meditation and perhaps with which we can close it. Let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to which God called you. Incredible. God called me to my life. God assigned me my life, that ordinary life full of ordinary work, ordinary moments. It's something divine. It comes from God. And so therefore, there are no shortcuts. I have to take it all seriously, obviously with a lot of joy and with, and with a sense of humor, not taking ourselves seriously, but yes, taking our life seriously, our commitments seriously. We go to Our Lady. She did all this, and she did it in spades, and she did it with a great grace and a great class, a great joy, a great peace. Our Lady, Our Mother, help us on this Feast of St. Josemaria to learn to turn our work into prayer, to see our workplace as an altar, to find God in our work, to love God in our work, 
and in a certain sense to become to become divine, sanctified, holy in our work. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.